Hello and a very warm welcome to this video. Thank you all very much indeed for joining it. You're looking at the front entrance to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, one of the great libraries of the world. And there you can see students making their way to the front door, having to walk around a pompous bronze military figure as though he's guarding the books in the library. He is William, 3rd Earl of Pembroke, who was Chancellor of Oxford University from 1617 to 1630. And it was during this period, of course, that he had dedicated to him and to his brother the great folio of William Shakespeare's works in 1623. He's standing in a rather poncy position, you may think. What he's doing is emulating an obsolete English letter known as the Thorn, there's a beautiful example of a thorn from a very old manuscript in the Bodleian Library behind him. You can see why it's called a thorn. A thorn, of course, is a T and an H. If you put TH together, you get what is sacred symbol of the Royal Arch Freemasons known as the Triple Tau. William Earl of Pembroke was Grand Master of the Freemasons from 1618 to 1630. And he was also Lord Chamberlain of the Household from 1615 to 1626 which gave him a pretty well direct control over the plays that were performed at court. Now, this statue was hanging around at Wilton, the seat of the Earls of Pembroke near Salisbury, for uh, many years until it was donated on the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Shakespeare First Folio, i.e. in 1723, by a descendant to the Bodleian Library. The Bodleian Library at first had it indoors and then they placed it here. If they put it here in order to stand as a guard against the pilfering of books, it was a very ironically a bad choice because two famous books dedicated to this very man, to the third Earl of Pembroke, uh, were stolen from the Bodleian Library. One of these was a copy of Ben Jonson's epigrams, which the library bought in 1614, this was the quarto edition, had it bound in 1614, had it returned to the library in a shelf mark and then was taken away and this is particularly sad because no other example of the quarto edition of Johnson's epigrams exists in the whole world so I wish they had guarded that properly. The other book dedicated to the Earl of Pembroke which was stolen from the library is this, the great folio of William Shakespeare. They seem to have it in about 1624 bound by a man called Wild Goose, and then it vanished. The library spins a yarn. It says it probably didn't vanish. It was probably sold by the library when they had a policy of selling old books when a newer edition came in. I don't think this is the case. There's actually uh, plenty of evidence that it was ripped from its chain and was, in fact, stolen. But the library, of course, was embarrassed when it reappeared in 1905 and had to go to rich donors and say, please give us some money to buy back the book that we had stolen. So they rather changed the story, I think. But it is an interesting book, and you can see that it has its original binding on it. It is also in a rather damaged condition. If you look here on the left, you can see two poems have been written in manuscript hand on a page that should actually have uh, the printed poem by Ben Jonson. Here is a first folio in much better condition to the reader, this figure that thou here seest put on the left. So that page has been uh, ripped out and on the end paper or on the pasted down end paper, someone has written two poems, but you can see that page has been very badly damaged. That tear at the top, top left, it looks so much as if someone has deliberately ripped that page in order to hide something that was written behind it, of which nothing remains except just, you can just tell this little dash of ink coming out of the side, which corresponds, I think, to the dash of ink that the same writer has put on short, on Johnson at the bottom, and on wit, which he's written twice, that long dash. These transcriptions can be dated to the end of the 17th century. You see the top one mentions Dryden, who died in 1700, was at the peak of his fame at the end of the 17th century. And the bottom poem, which is Ben Jonson's poem, it has the title Under Shakespeare's Picture by Ben Jonson. Well, as we know in the first folio, as we've seen, it's not under this picture, it's to the left, and it appeared to the left in the second folio of 1632 as well, and it appeared only under the picture in 1664 for the first time in what is known as the 
third folio or third impression. So that dates these transcriptions to some time after 1664 and before 1700. I have already gone through the bottom poem by Ben Jonson on another presentation called Ben Jonson New. And I don't want to go into it in any detail now, but just to remind you that it did tell us who the true author of Shakespeare's plays was, that this poem is divided into 40 metrical feet. And if you count those metrical feet, 11 plus 9 plus 11 plus 9, which adds up to 40, and look at those metrical feet, you get the message, Veer had his wit, Veer writ his book. As I say, I don't want to go over that again, but do look at a presentation I put online called Ben Johnson New, and there I explain why it is and how it is that you're supposed to look for this 119119 11, figuration and to find that message. Here I want to talk about the top of the two poems, which does not, some of you will be relieved to hear, involve a cipher, but it involves a very very clever allusion that can leave you in absolutely no doubt whatsoever that it, like the poem beneath it, is also telling you that Shakespeare is Edward de Vere. I will, of course, come to that clever allusion, but let us first just look at the poem itself and what it appears to be saying. So let us go through this short poem, taking two lines at a time. An active swain to make a leap was seen, which shamed his fellow shepherds on the green. Swain and shepherds are interchangeable words. They just mean poet. This is a convention that goes right back to the eclogues of Virgil and to the classics and used a lot in the Renaissance. If you think of Spencer's Shepherd's Calendar, for instance, very, very conventional, very normal to call poets swains and shepherds milching around on the green. So an active poet to make a leap was seen, which shamed his fellow poets on the green. How do you shame your fellow poets as an active poet? Well, you exceed them. You do something that outstretches them and outperforms them by miles. So let's say a lively poet made a leap surpassing his fellow poets. And growing vain, he would essay, that means to try, he would essay once more, but lost the fame which he had gained before. So we learn here that this unnamed poet, who has surpassed his fellow poets by doing this unspecified leap, he was famous. He was famous originally, but by doing this leap, he has lost his fame. So which, despite his best efforts, made him lose his previous fame Oft did he try, at length was forced to yield, he stove in vain, he had himself excelled. I said stove, you might think that's a mistranscription, should be strove, but it could be stove, meaning he heated, he sweated away in vain, he had himself excelled. So, And for all his trying, he had to concede that he had surpassed himself. So unnamed poet takes a leap, surpasses his fellows and surpasses himself. So, as in, in this way, in the same way, nature, once in her essays of wit, in Shakespeare took the shepherd's lucky leap. So nature took precisely the same leap as the shepherd. And this is underscored, if you like, by the occurrence of once in her essays, and of course that leap which was to essay once, this correlation to connect the two to show that the shepherd's leap uh, uh, and natures in Shakespeare are the same leap. So nature once in her essays of wit in Shakespeare took the shepherd's lucky leap, but overstraining in the great effort in Dryden and the rest has since fell short. So in other words, in this way, nature taking that leap in Shakespeare overstrained herself and is unable ever to produce so great a poet again. So if we take that through, just to be clear what it's saying, a lively poet made a leap surpassing his fellow poets, which despite his best efforts made him lose his previous fame. And for all his trying, he had to concede that he had surpassed himself. In this way, nature, taking that leap in Shakespeare, overstrained herself and is unable ever to produce so great a poet again. Needless to say... If you are a Stratfordianist and you do not believe that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym, 
this poem leaves you in the most appalling pickle, and that is why we have had so far no Stratfordianist giving us a proper indication of what it is about, because it creates problem after problem after problem. Why, he has to ask himself, in the first folio of Shakespeare, did someone write a poem which is all about an unnamed poet who's so brilliant that he exceeds all the other poets and even exceeds himself? What connection is this unnamed poet leaping about to William Shakespeare? Uh, why is it in the Shakespeare book? Etc, etc. One problem after another. Of course, if you realise that William Shakespeare is a pseudonym, then the whole matter becomes pretty easy. In fact, we can break this poem down into three rather simple statements that a famous poet uh, took a leap, and we know what that leap is. Obviously, he hid himself suddenly uh, behind the pseudonym William Shakespeare. And in taking this leap, this uh, poet not only excels, surpasses other poets, remember he shamed his fellows on the green, uh, but in doing this also the great Shakespeare, he excels even himself, i.e. He, he lost his previous fame and he excels himself, and furthermore that in nature, uh, you remember how nature completely knackered herself uh, taking this leap in Shakespeare, this essay of wit, and so that as Shakespeare uh, he even transcends nature. Now, these three statements, he excels himself, he surpasses others, he transcends nature, are very, very particular. And if I were to go to Professor Sir Stanley Wells or one of those great and brilliant Stratfordianist scholars and say, can you give me any corroboration of the fact that William Shakespeare of Stratford ever was said to excel himself, to, ex to surpass others and to transcend nature? He would have to scratch his head and say, no, I can't think of anything like that. However, there is one person who is praised in this way, and you can probably guess who it is, and he's praised by Gabriel Harvey in 1578. Gabriel Harvey was a don at Cambridge, and on this occasion he stood up in front of the Queen and the court, and he looked the Earl of Oxford in the eyes, and he addressed him poem directly addressed to him and in that poem he says to the Earl of Oxford with your mind fire and noble heart you will excel yourself surpass others and your great glory will spread everywhere beyond the frozen ocean the frozen ocean obviously the the, the poles the very ends of the earth in other words you will transcend nature this was a prediction by Gabriel Harvey of how the Earl of Oxford would perform. He would he would excel himself, surpass others, and transcend nature. Exactly the same as is being said about William Shakespeare. But such a such a brilliant thing to say and such a clever thing to say. One surprise is one not that this came out of the mouth of Gabriel Harvey, the rather stodgy Cambridge Don. Where did he get this idea from? Well, actually, he leaves us a little clue in exactly the same address that he gave to the Earl of Oxford on that occasion. He said to him, your epistle testifies how much you excel in letters, being more courtly and more polished than Castiglione himself. Castiglione, several generations older than the Earl of Oxford, an Italian uh, courtier, nobleman, poet, playwright, man of genius, uh, greatly admired by the Earl of Oxford. So what is Gabriel Harvey talking about when he says your epistle testifies how much you excel in letters? What epistle is he talking about? He is actually talking about this, which is an epistle written into the first Latin translation of Castiglione's famous book called The Courtia, originally written in Italian. This Latin edition was published first in 1571 and was very, very popular, went into more editions, in fact, than the English translation by a man called Thomas Hobie at the time. I would say that of all the things that Edward de Vere published under his own name, this was the most famous, and as I say, it was published many times. And in here he praises Castiglione for the extraordinary feat of having written this book and having Written the book, he says, Sipsum Castillo vicit, he excels himself, qui reliquos vincit, he surpasses others, 
et naturam superavit, he transcends nature. So now we can see how this extraordinary trio of complements stuck together had the history starting with the Earl of Oxford uh, complimenting Castiglione, complimenting the playwright, the poet, the courtier, the nobleman, the genius. He excels himself, he surpasses others, he transcends nature. That this is read by Gabriel Harvey in 1578, and Gabriel Harvey, so impressed by this letter of the Earl of Oxford, he picks up these compliments and throws them back at the Earl of Oxford himself. You will excel yourself, you will surpass others, you will transcend nature. And then 100 years later, the learned poet in the Bodleian First Folio writes of this brilliant nobleman, genius, poet, playwright, courtier, that he excels himself, he surpasses others, he transcends nature. It can leave us in no doubt whatsoever that this poem is talking about the Earl of Oxford. Not only, as I say, it has nothing to do with William Shakespeare of Stratford, but it also knocks out any rival claimants such as Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe, Henry Neville, because the poem stipulates that the mysterious poet was famous before he donned the mask of Shakespeare, and none of those were famous as poets before the name Shakespeare comes along in the mid-1590s. Now, I called this presentation Shakespeare Exposed in a Stolen Manuscript, a bit of a naughty clickbait perhaps, but you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you will also be aware that this is part of an ongoing series in each of which I take a contemporary of the 16th or 17th centuries and showed how that contemporary knew that William Shakespeare was the pseudonym used by the Earl of Oxford. Do please explore them. There on the left you'll see all the titles that are currently up online and there will be more to come very soon, I can assure you. Also, the De Vere Society, of which I'm currently chairman, is a charity dedicated to researching and disseminating the truth of Shakespeare and authorship. Do visit our formidable new website and our newly published and relaunched Twitter and Facebook. We organise trips, tours, publications, debates, conferences and plays, and we welcome all lovers of Shakespeare as members. We have never yet declined a donation. Thank you for watching.